What comes to mind when you see that word, promise, promises? What comes to your mind when you hear that word and see that word written? I think there's a, a lot of responses that we could come up with right here in this room. There's probably uh, as many responses as there are people sitting here right now. But I think at some level, the thing that's probably common uh, among most, if not all of us, is something that comes to mind when we hear and think about the idea of promises and that word promise is that the idea of broken promises come to mind, right? Broken promises, promises that were not kept to us. Things that should have been kept, promises that should have been kept that weren't, and promises maybe that weren't kept for a variety of reasons. So there are a lot of reasons people break their promises, right? Sometimes we, you, you may have broken your promise this week, right? And sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes it comes from forgetfulness. Sometimes the broken promise comes from a factor that's outside of your control. The traffic was too heavy or something along those lines, right? Sometimes a broken promise is willful. We do it on purpose. Someone does that on purpose to us. There are a lot of different reasons for broken promises, but one of the great realities about promises as it relates to God is that none of the things that come into play when we break our promises are are relatable for him. He's different. He doesn't break a promise because in his person, he is different from us. The verse you saw displayed there is sort of our our home verse, our theme verse throughout the course of this brand new series we're starting that will take us through the rest of the summer. It's a series just simply called Promises. And then the theme verse comes from 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 3 and 4. Peter says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Man, Peter really knows how to start a letter. Like he gets through the greeting and he just dives right in. Because we just sung a song a minute ago about the living hope, right? That's the beginning of 1 Peter. He jumps right in. He's like, we have this living hope. We have this promise that cannot perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. And he has all these things that he just jumps straight into, these deep ideas. So there's a lot to unpack in verses 3 and 4 here of 2 Peter, just like there is a lot to unpack in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, which we did at Christmas Eve. Um, But Peter just knows how to start a letter, and what we're going to look at really centers around that idea of the promises. We're going to look at three things that Peter teaches us about God's promises this morning as we enter in. The rest of this series, what we're going to do is we're going to look at specific and individual promises that God gives to his people, promises that we can rest in, reasons that we can have trust in him, things that God promises us that sometimes seem like they may not be happening right now, and for us to be able to have the perspective that we need in order to trust God as we walk through life and as he makes promises to us through his word. So that's where we're going this summer. We're going to have, uh, we're going to hear from a variety of people too, which is going to be awesome. People who these promises they're going to be speaking about are personal to them as we walk through this promises series. So the first thing I want us to see here, three things that Peter teaches us, and they all start, each sentence is going to start with God's promises are, and then you fill in the blank. The first thing is that God's promises are based on who he is. His promises are based on who he is. Once again, first, or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Right? A couple things here. And then he's going to talk about promises right after that. Through these, through his glory and goodness, we have the promises. Okay, a couple things though from, from this first uh, verse here in verse 3. A promise is just as good as the one person making it, right? That's as, that's as valuable as a promise is. It's only as valuable as the person who is making the promise. And here's what we can know about the, our promise maker from Scripture. First of all, there's two things that Peter says. First, he has divine power, right? He has divine power. In other words, he is able. He is able. Our promise maker is able to follow through on his promises. He, he doesn't get lost in terms of his will. He doesn't have a weak will. He doesn't have anything that prevents him from following through. Traffic jams don't get to him. Changes in the economy don't affect him. He follows through on his promises regardless of external circumstances, regardless of his feelings, regardless of, uh, of other things that can go on and get in the way. He is not subject 
to uh, having his power fail in those ways because he comes with divine power, with ultimate power. So our promise maker is able. He is able. And the second thing that Peter says about our promise maker is that he is good, right? He talks about his glory and his goodness. He doesn't have a character flaw, right? He doesn't have a weakness of will. There's no selfishness to prevent him from following through on what he promises to us. That's what we see from God from the first pages of Scripture to the last. In Numbers chapter 23, going back to the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 23, we see so much about God's character. And some of that comes through in his own pronouncements. Some of that comes through from prophets. We see that here uh, from God speaking through a prophet, an imperfect pro- a very imperfect prophet. But he speaks through this prophet. He says, God is not human that he should lie. He's not a human being that he should change his mind. Does God speak and then not act? Does he promise and then not fulfill? Right? He's asking these, these questions that you already know the answers to as, as he's uh, walking through this passage. He's, does he speak and then not act? Of course he acts when he speaks. Does he promise and then not fulfill? Of course not. God fulfills his promises. That's who he is. That's who he's always been. That's who he always will be. That idea of God being unchanging is something that theologians call the immutability of God. He does not change. Other things don't change him. He doesn't evolve and develop. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is the same. He's immutable. And this is one of God's, there's different characteristics of God. Some of them are communicable attributes, meaning they're things that relate to us, right? Like that God loves that he has community, that he enjoys fellowship, right? These are things that we can understand as human beings, that he has even emotions, he has feelings, right? There's, there's all sorts of things that we see that are communicable between us and God. He has a, a conscience, he has a will, or not conscience, but he is conscious, he has a will, right? He relates, all of these things. Really, the way that we're created in, in the image of God is the, are the ways that we mirror him and reflect him in the communicable attributes, of God. But then there's incommunicable attributes of God, which means these are things that God has within himself that we don't possess, like his perfection, right? His, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, he's all-powerful, and his immutability, the fact that he does not change. We change, and for, for all of us, that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing that we change, because sometimes over time, we can change our mind from a, a wrong view to a right view. Sometimes we can listen to somebody else and be educated. Sometimes we can uh, be transformed by the word of God. All of us at one point were separate from Christ and therefore didn't have the spirit. And then he comes and he changes us. So it's good that we can change, but it's really good that God can't because he is perfect. And so God is immutable. And his promises are based on that person, that perfect and permanent person. This person who he is, he was before, he is today, and will, ever, uh, will forevermore be, is that that's what our promises are based on. And it's based on the fact that he is able and that he is good. Our God is powerful and our God is good to us. He loves us. And so we have these promises that are based on the person of God, that's based on who he is. The second thing is that God's promises are invaluable to his people. They're, they're invaluable. We can't even put a value on them. They're so powerful. They're so strong. We need them and uh, we live based on them. Here's what it says in verse four. Through these, these being his glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, them being the promises this time, through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Peter calls these promises very great and precious. Very great and precious. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises. So because of God's goodness and his glory, we receive great and precious promises. Now, Peter seems to like the word precious, right? He's like Schmeagel um, or Gollum. Is it Gollum? I don't know. Like He's got the double personality thing. If you're a fan of the Lord of the Rings, you can school me after service. Um, but, you know, he just sits around and goes, my precious, all the time, right? That's not Peter. He reserves the word precious for things that are truly precious, but he does use it in the moments where it's deserving. A few things that Peter, in his couple of letters, uh, calls precious. He says that we have a precious faith. He calls the blood of Christ precious, the precious blood of Christ Referring to Jesus, he calls him our precious cornerstone. And right here, these precious 
very great and precious promises. Part of what makes these promises great and precious is our assurance that we just talked about. The fact that they're based on who God is. The fact that we have an assurance of their fulfillment because of who God is. That makes them very great and very precious. But there's, there are other reasons that they're very great and precious as well. We just sung uh, a second ago, we tagged on to the Living Hope song, that, that verse or that chorus from um, uh, the, the Yes and Amen song. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, For every one of God's promises is yes in him. And therefore through him we also say amen to the glory of God. Of God. God's promises are yes and amen. They're fulfilled. They're true. They, he follows through. That's part of what makes these promises precious to us. It's part of what makes these promises great for us. But another reason that these promises are very great and precious has to do with the effect, the impact on us. What, is, what are these promises? And we're going to be looking at the promises throughout the course of this series, but he's promising us eternal life. He's promising us eternal life that starts even now. He's promising us relationship with God through him. He's promising us a clean slate. He's promising us his spirit. He's making all sorts of promises to us. He's promising to wipe every tear from every eye, to restore creation to the perfection that he intended it to be. He promises to work out all things for the good of those who love him. He makes all sorts of promises throughout scripture. They're very great and precious because of what the promises consist of as well. But they're also great because of the end effect on us as his followers. And that brings us to the third point. God's promises are intended to result in godliness. Once again, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. says, through these, these the glory and goodness, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises... So that through them, the promises, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. There's a positive and there's a negative side to this. The positive side is is what he calls participation in the divine nature. Now, what does that mean? It sounds cool. What does it mean? It's not like a pantheism thing. It's not like God in everything, that we become gods or become like God uh, in that sense, that we become powerful, become one like in, in, in that sense with him, like a pantheism or panentheism might teach. But what it, what it is telling us is that we get to participate in his attributes, that we get to participate in his goodness. We get to experience his transformation power in our lives as he takes us from being far from him and draws us close to him. As he takes us from being slaves to sin, which we were singing about a little bit earlier, to being freed from that. We're freed from sin. We're freed from the effects of sin. We're freed from death, right? And we get in that way, we, in that sense, we get to participate in the divine nature that God has. He's got a divine power. He's got a divine nature. We get to participate in those. We get to participate in that. That's on the positive side. The negative side, meaning things that we don't do, he says we're escaping corruption, right? We're escaping the corruption of the world. We're escaping from sin. We're getting away from sin and the power of sin in our lives, right? Not, not only toward God, but away from sin. It's both. That's what it looks like to be in relationship with him, is we're fleeing from sin. We're getting out of the corruption, the corruptive power of sin, but we're also moving in towards his goodness, away from the things that hold us back and toward the one who sets us free. That's what it looks like to walk with him. There's a positive and a negative side to this. So how do these promises result in goodness? His promises result in goodness in our lives because of what he does what he accomplishes. And part of his promises is what he's going to do in us, what he's going to do through us, what he's going to do to transform us from the inside out. If you've ever seen the movie Hook, starring Robin Williams, and who's, what's the other guy's name? Dustin Hoffman, right? I just drew a sudden blank. Uh, it came back. I, and it just, just a great movie. I, I kind of grew up on that movie. Love that movie. Um, but in Hook, Captain Hook draws Peter Pan, an adult, a grown-up Peter Pan's son, away from him because he keeps pointing back to the broken promises, right? The broken promises. Because what happened is Peter's like a busy, dedicated businessman, and he keeps missing his son's games and all these important events in his life. And he promises him, at one point he says, I promise you I'm going to make it to one of your baseball games. And then the season gets to the end. It's his last game. He's waiting for his dad to show up. He no-shows, right? And the, that becomes a little bit of a theme throughout the rest 
of the movie. And Hook draws Jack away from his dad because he can't keep his promises. He even tells Jack, I don't promise things that I don't follow through on, right? Like, he's trying to make that claim. And uh, so the reality is we develop a loyalty to the one who keeps their promises. And And Hook, even though he's the evil character, is playing off of that. And it becomes an important lesson for Peter throughout the, the course of the movie. Um, but the, these promises that we, that we are kept in our lives, we start to develop that loyalty toward the one who's trustworthy, right? And, when, and on the other side, when people break their promises, it's really difficult to put our trust in them in the future. We can't, we can't uh, trust them with our lives anymore. We can't trust them with their word anymore. But the good news is that God follows through. And as he follows through, in our lives and his promises, he, he gains more trust from us. We, can, we put more trust in him. And at the end of the day, following Jesus involves a lot of trust. Following God and obeying his, his uh, commands, it involves a lot of trust. A lot of trust. Really, that's what it is. That's the core of it. When we put our faith, our trust in Jesus, we start a relationship with him. As we walk through life, we make decisions out of our trust for Jesus. Sometimes we kind of go halfway in. We want to we want to be part way. But God calls us to be completely in when it comes to our trust in Him, our faith in Him. And we gain that faith as we lean on His promises and watch Him follow through for us. Later on in 2 Peter, in the letter, he, he talks about a couple of things. First of all, he talks about the fact that, that God is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, he says in verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So that's relating to specifically the promise that he's going to come again, right? That he's going to bring home those who are in Christ. And it, Peter's saying, look, we're waiting, we're anxiously awaiting that day where he will restore all things and make all things right again. Where he will come back for his people and bring us home. And we're waiting and it seems like, oh, it's not happening. It's continuing on, continuing on. And even people began to make fun of Christians, even in the first century. Like, hey, you said this guy was coming back. Where is he? Peter's like, hey, take, take a breath. He's not slow in keeping his promises, as some people understand slow. No, this is patience. Because he wants people to know him. He wants people to come to know him. He he doesn't want anyone to perish. So he's being patient with us. So sometimes when we don't see our promises follow through, we don't don't see God happening, doing the thing on our timelines because he's doing it on his. He's being patient. He's being patient. We need to be patient as we wait for him as well. And then just uh, a little bit after that, in verse 11, he says, since everything, he starts talking about the fact that everything's going to be destroyed and he's going to restore all things, right? And the first step to that is really it's a destruction of what we see, the imperfect world. And then he renews our world. And our permanent home in heaven is actually earth. It's new heavens, new earth. He restores it to the perfection that he had originally designed it to have. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, Peter says, what kind of people ought you to be? What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Speed that day is coming. That's what we ought to do in the meantime, right? Because God's promises, his future promise of restoration of this world leads us to realize that the thing that's the most valuable, the thing that outlasts this life, is our dedication to him. Our holiness in him, our submission to him, our coming closer to him, our obedience to him, our righteousness in him. These things are the things that last. In this, life, in this life. And so we ought to live holy and godly lives because everything else, everything else that we see is temporary. Everything else is temporary, but when we follow his word and we walk in step with him in this life, that has an effect into eternity. Peter is saying that godliness matters deeply. Godliness matters in a, in a profound way. Our holiness, our righteousness, our godliness in this life matters. And so the result of God's promise leading to godliness, that's a very good thing. <laughs> that's a very good thing. That's a promise in and of itself, that God's promises lead to godliness. And we need to put our trust in that, and we need to follow him, even in those moments where it's very difficult to do that. 
And so this summer, we're going to take some time. We're going to reflect on the many promises of God. Not all of them. Not all, it would take us forever to walk through Scripture and reflect on all of them. But many of the promises of God, we're going to reflect on them. We're going to talk about them. And we want to allow these promises to form us into more godly people. That's the goal, as we trust him more. So here's my question that I want us to ask ourselves. Am I trusting God to keep his promises to me? Even when it's not looking so good. Even where I'm saying, like with many of the psalmists, where are you, God? Where are you? Am I yet turning to trust in him, even in those dark moments? Many of the psalms go to a pretty dark place. Only one of them doesn't resolve. Just about every single other, uh, of the other psalms says, God, yet I know you're going to come through. I know you're going to come through. Sometimes we get to that point of despair, but can we still whisper in that moment, God, I know you'll come through for me. Am I trusting God to keep his promises? And is that leading me to follow him in my life more closely? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your truth, for your promises, for your word. We thank you that you even give us the opportunity to put our trust in you. And God, we just, we just want to, today, we just want to put, put a, draw a line in the sand and just say, Lord, we are going to put our trust in you while we live our lives in this world, even when things are uncertain, even when doubt creeps in even when challenges seem to be winning out. We are going to trust you. Lord, we know that you don't promise a perfect, pain-free, or easy life. But you promise to walk through it with us. You promise to set it right at the end. You promise justice. You promise goodness. Lord, we, may we submit to your commands and may we believe and, and follow your promises. Lord, stake our lives on it because you're worthy. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that we can trust your promises because of who you are. Pray that you would help us to walk with you every day. In Jesus' name. I invite you guys to stand as we sing this last song. And one of the lines, it says, Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And just as Mark said, let's not forget that the Lord keeps his promises, that we can remain steadfast in him, knowing that his promises are true. So I invite you guys, if you know this song, to sing it with us.
Let's pray real quick. Uh, Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Day in and day out, God, you are a faithful God, a never-changing God, Lord. And so, Lord, as we continue to go through this series uh, this summer of your promises and reflecting on them, Lord, may we trust in your faithfulness always, God. For it's evident, Lord. It's evident in the fact that we are here right now amongst one another in your presence, God. You are a faithful Father. And so we say thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, just a couple things before we uh, head over to the schoolhouse for the picnic. Um, as always, we're just thankful. we thankful as a church for just the generosity of this church. And, you know, we believe that God is the ultimate provider of our lives, right? Financially, our health, our family, whatever. He is the ultimate provider of our lives. And so we never want to just keep these things that the Lord is blessing us with, but we want to give. And so there are two different ways that you can give. Um, you can give online or you can just drop uh, your donation uh, in the buckets on the way out. But as always, church, we just appreciate your generosity and really the Lord and his faithfulness uh, to us in providing us with everything that we need. Uh, if you're a visitor, we're so glad that you are here with us this morning. We just don't even want you to worry about that last announcement. We're just glad that you would choose this Sunday to be here with us, and we really want to connect with you. So on your way out, please stop by the welcome desk so we can get to know you um, and just really explain uh, the vision of this church and get connected with you. And so as we leave this place, as we reflect on uh, what the Holy Spirit spoke through Mark, um, let us remember these promises, but not just remember them, but but like Mark said, let's trust in them. Because we, we can know them, we can understand them, but if we don't trust them, then it's not going to change us. It's not going to mean anything. So let's trust the promises that God has given us and has said to us through his word. Amen? All right, we'll see you next week.